Well, hey, Cornerstone, good morning. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope you get to be with somebody you love today, even if you're six feet apart. We miss having you in person around here, but it's good to be with you. About this time last year in this room, we packed 400 women for our annual women's retreat. And if anyone had said the word mask, I would have thought spa day. So much has changed in the last year. And we're not doing a retreat this year for obvious reasons, but we are hosting a women's night of worship. Friday, February 26, from seven to 10, we'll spend the evening in worship and connection with each other. We're following all of our COVID safety protocols. We'll be in the sanctuary at 25% capacity, and then we'll spend some time together outside to connect. My guess is that you need this more than you know. You can register at hpmc.org slash events. And if you're still not comfortable coming into our building in person, we have a virtual option for you. So you can check which way you want to attend the evening. I hope to see you there. We are so looking forward to gathering together. One more thing I want to tell you before we dive into worship this morning. This Wednesday, February 17th, kicks off the 40 days before Easter. It's the season we call Lent. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. It's a somber moment in the church when we pause to remember that from dust we came and to dust we'll return. And maybe this year more than ever, that's been a powerful, poignant message. So you can join us at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, or you can tune in online at hpmc.org, 7 p.m. this Wednesday. We do ask that you make a reservation to show up um, in person, hpumc.org slash events. Now we're gonna worship together this morning. Matt's gonna continue our series in Exodus. We love hearing about how your reading is going in this plan so far. So tag us in your posts and share with us your stories. But let's worship together. Hey friends, good morning, and welcome to Cornerstone. Welcome this week to those of you that are at home, and welcome to those of you that are in person. I'm coming to you by video in person because this week I am on lockdown. I'm quarantined because last week Amy had COVID. Now, she is doing way better. She's still a little bit tired, but no symptoms, but out of, as they say, an abundance of caution, I'm quarantining this week. Now, I I need you to know, I feel like I am on a ridiculous streak right now. I mean, what Tommy Brady did last week, I mean, that's pretty good. Seven Super Bowls, but I I just need you to know, I I feel like I am on a ridiculous streak myself. It's only two, but think with me for just a second about the last two sermons that I preached, okay? Two sermons ago, I talked about not letting your heart get tied to your stuff. And what happened? That week, our house caught on fire. I watched firefighters shovel our stuff out the back door, okay? And then last week, and one would think that would be enough, okay? Then last week, I preached on, not last week, but last time I preached two weeks ago, I preached on the importance of slowing down so that we can show up for other people. And then we got quarantined. I mean, this streak is ridiculous. I'm hoping that it at least goes to three weeks because today I'll be talking about miracles, okay? Today, we're gonna talk about what the Bible has to say about Powerball numbers. And then we're gonna talk about the story in Revelation that talks about the Falcons winning the Super Bowl this year. That's where we're going this morning. We're gonna keep this streak alive. Okay, now look, here's where we're actually going this morning. We may get to Powerball numbers and to the Falcons, but, but first, let's do this. I'm making an assumption this morning. Here's the assumption that I'm making. I'm making the assumption that if you were a part of this today, either at home or in person, that there is something inside of you that has a desire to at least know more about God. 
Okay, maybe you're even just beginning to explore this, but there is something that's a little bit of a nudge saying, I, I'd like to know more about this whole God thing. And for some of you, it's gone to another step and you not only wanna know more about God, but you have the sense that you actually want to know God, that you actually want to, to get to know this God. And here's the next assumption that I'm making. I'm assuming that for most of us, we are overcomplicating this. Now, does this mean this whole God thing is simple? No, there's a lifetime's worth of stuff to learn, okay? Again, knowing God is a, knowing about God is a lifelong journey. But I think that many of us are making this journey more complicated, more complex than it needs to be. For some of us, we think that a life with God is a life where we are, 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 are perfect in some way. We're, we're, we're living this like ideal, and look, it's not. A life with God is not a life where we are perfect. A life with God is a life where we're something else. And that something else is what I wanna talk about this morning. If you just have the sense you want to know more about God or you want to know God better, your next step I think is likely more simple than most of us make it. So that's what we're gonna go after this morning. What it looks like to live a life with God. If that's something that you're interested in. Pray with me, and then we're gonna dive in. Let's pray together. God, thanks for this time that we have. Lord, thank you for the ways that you're working in all of our lives and the way that somehow you've gotten us to a place where we want to at least know more about this whole God thing and where some of us e even want to know you. We believe there's something to this and we want to know you. So during this conversation, guide us. Take the words I prepared, bring them to life. I pray the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, the, the thoughts that we think, Lord, during this time, that they'll, they'll be guided by, they'll be pleasing to you. I pray these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, over the next three weeks, we're gonna be looking at one continuous story. You know, we're reading together as a church right now the book of Exodus, and if you're not engaged in that so far, that's totally fine. We're only a weekend. It's five chapters. In my Bible, that's four and a half pages. You can catch up this week. Go to hpmc.org slash Bible to find out all of the info there. But over the next three weeks on Sunday mornings, we're gonna be looking at one continuous story that takes place in the first part of Exodus. And th this is what this story is about. It's about this. It's about a group of people that feel like they are meant to be something different and to do something different. That they're meant to be different than the people around them and they're meant to do things that are different than the people around them. They feel like they're, they're, they're meant to do something different. If you had to sum up what this, like, uh, th th this in their life, this mission that they have, it's to be like a lighthouse and to shine like God's light out to people who don't yet know God. If you had to sum it up, that's what it is. Who, who are these people? Well, at the time they're called the Hebrews or the Israelites. We now know them as the Jews. It's a name that they take on uh, later. The Hebrews and the Jews, they, they feel like they are, they're meant to be something different, to do something different. So let's just pause there for a second. And let me ask you, do you have that sense? Do you have a sense um, of who you were meant to be, of what you're meant to do? I was talking with somebody this week, a member of our church, who professionally has um, this particular skill set, and she's really excelled in her industry in ha having this particular skill set. And over the last couple of years, she has really felt led to do something, to use that skill set that she has to, to help the church. And not just this church, though fortunately this church is a part of that, but really to help the church as a whole to speak to people that, that maybe it's not currently speaking to, to help more people to come and to walk in the way of Jesus. That's something that she feels led to do. I was talking to somebody else earlier this week, and what he was saying is that he feels led to be someone who is less tethered to the opinions of others less tied down by his reputation and what other people think about him. It's something that he feels led to be. Is there something that you feel led to be or something that you feel led to do? And, and maybe what you can do is you can take that and actually write it down on a piece of paper. Okay? Write it down on a piece of paper. We'll deal with it some this week, but this is gonna carry over for the next few weeks. So this is the story. It's about the Israelites who, who are meant to be to do something, but 
They're stuck. They're stuck somewhere underneath someone's thumb that's keeping them where they are. That's preventing them from fully being who they're meant to be, from fully doing what they're meant to do. And, and what's that jar for them? Well, that, that jar, it's, it's the nation of Egypt. And even more specifically, it's the Egyptian king, Pharaoh, who's holding them down, keeping them where they are, preventing them from fully being who they're meant to be, fully doing what they're meant to do. And what the story that we're going to see over the next three weeks is, is it's the story of how God intervenes to get the people out of the jar, to get the people out of from underneath Pharaoh's thumb to, to, to get them free. So it's obvious what I'm about to ask you. What's your jar? It's not the nation of Egypt. It's not the Pharaoh. What, what's your jar? What is it that is holding you down, preventing you from being, preventing you from doing? What is that for you? Now, I'm going to encourage you perhaps to actually do this. I mean, you can do this in your mind, but perhaps you will actually do this. Take a piece of paper, write that down on the inside, and then take, if you've got a glass jar, that's best, but you can take a Ziploc baggie or a piece of Tupperware and put that on the outside and write down what it is that's, that's holding you down, what it is that you're captive to. And over the next couple of weeks, as we see how it is that God gets his people out of Egypt, you might just find that this is saying something to you about how God is intending to get you out from under whatever's holding you down. Also, today we start by looking at how God called someone in particular to be the one that he would use more than anybody else to crack this jar open. And as we see the first little bit of this person's life, I think that it says something to us today it's 21st century Americans. It says something to us today about what it looks like for us also to live a life where we are walking with God. So if you want to follow along, you can turn with me to Exodus 3. The scripture will also be on the screen, but if you want to make notes and whatnot, you can, can make the notes turning uh, to Exodus 3. So here's how it starts. Verse 1, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. So Moses. Moses pre-Jesus is the person who does more for God, like partners with God more than anybody else. And you got a lot of people that do a lot pre-Jesus. Number one on that list. He's the person who pre-Jesus has a more personal relationship with God than anybody else. More personal relationship with God, doing more for God than anybody else pre-Jesus. And this is the beginning of his journey with God. Now, in chapter two, you, you should read this. I mean, the beginning of Exodus, it reads like a novel. You've got to go back and read this, and it's not very long. It talks about him as an infant. It's amazing stuff that happens in his life. It talks about him as a young man. And now we find him living outside of Egypt, which is where he grew up, living outside of Egypt in the land of Midian, and something uh, incredible happens in his life this day. He's out there tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro, who was the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, to Horeb, the mountain of God, that we'll find out more about later. We don't need to worry about that now, but this is where he is. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. There's a bush that's on fire. Not too surprising. They're living in a dry, arid, very hot area that a bush would be on fire. Not really surprising. But he looked and behold, the bush was burning yet it wasn't consumed. So there, there's no smoke, and the, the, the bush isn't um, being destroyed by the fire. Now, here, here's a little plug for this Bible study that I do every day on Instagram and on our church's app. We talked this week about why it's important that it's burning and it's not consumed. But we're not going to go into that now, but there, there's a really particular reason why this is important. There, there's a reason I talk about the Bible study, and there's also this. It, it gets Moses' attention. And Moses said... I'll turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, 
God called to him. Picture this. He's walking and he sees this bush on fire. And he could just keep going. He could just keep tending to his flock. He has other things going on. But he notices that there's something strange about this. There's something peculiar about this. And he turns aside to see. I think what most of us want is we want to just be driving in our car one day or be going about our business and all of a sudden just hear a voice that says, Matt, Matt, Amy, Amy, Thomas, Thomas, whatever it is. Just hear our voice. Just I... That's not what happens here. And it's not anything that's ever happened in my life. What happens here is that Moses notices something peculiar and he takes the time to turn aside and to explore it more. He takes this as, as, as a sign that, that he needs to investigate this further. For me, oftentimes the way that God works in my life is with something not necessarily so obvious, but with something that's just a little strange, something a little peculiar, something where I am inclined to turn aside and explore it a little bit further. And when Moses does that, when he turns aside, that's when he hears Moses, Moses. And there's nothing in the scripture that says that this is true, but there's always been a part of me that, that, that I've wondered, had God been trying to get Moses' attention before? As Moses had walked in the wilderness many, many times before, had there ever been that bush burning, but something was going on and he didn't notice or he didn't turn aside and see? I mean, we don't know that that's true, but I know that so many times in my life that's true. There are times when I don't take the time to turn aside and to see. He turns aside and he sees, and he hears the word Moses, Moses, and then he says, Moses does, here I am. It's the first thing that he says to God. He, here I am. Which means like, I not just physically here I am, but it means I'm, a, I'm available to you. It's what you say to a friend when you sit down and you're like locked in with them. He says, here I am. Like, I don't know what's going on, but you've got my attention. And then I'm not gonna read this part beginning in verse five, but God begins to lay out to him that he knows what's going on back in Israel. Now it's been decades since Moses has been there. A long time has passed, but Moses knows what's happening there too. He knows that, the paper stuck in the jar. He knows that, that the Israelites, that they're, they're stuck in slavery. And God says, I know this too. And I'm going to free them. I'm getting the lid off. And I'm going to send you to actually be the person who, who speaks to Pharaoh and makes this happen. And then Moses says the second thing to God. And really, maybe the only thing that he could say after he hears that this is, is, is what I'm going to have you do. He says in verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Hold on, hold on. Do you, do you know about me? I mean, do, do, do you know about it, just my crazy uh, upbringing? And you can read in chapter two to learn all about that. Certainly Moses has had many crises of identity in, in his life. Do you, know, do you know about what I did to, to that man that made me flee Egypt? He, he, he killed a man? Do you, do you know, who, me? Who, who am I? God's response is so good. Verse 12, this may be all that you need this morning. Verse 12, hey, I, I'll be with you. You know who you are, Moses? This is all you need to know. Before you're anything else, this is all you need to know. Who, who are you? You're someone that I'm with. That's it. That may be all that you need to hear this morning. Before you are anything else, who are you? You are someone that God is with. Moses then asks another question. So this is the third thing that he says, the second question. It's again, just such a natural progression here. Okay, so I am someone whom you are with. That's good. Now, now here's another one. Who are you? I mean, I, all I know is that you're like this bush that, that is speaking to me. I would like to know who it is that, that, that you are. And God says, well, famously, I am who I am. But I, I can't really be defined and again, in the Bible study this week, we go deeper into that with this divine name means, but I, 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 I'm different than anything that you can comprehend, Moses. I just am who I am. He explains that just a little bit. And then Moses says a third thing. So he says, here I am. Then he asks two questions. And now he expresses a concern. And here's the concern. Okay, God, let's, let's just be honest here. Okay, let's just live in reality for just a moment. Um, I'm gonna go back to Egypt. I'm gonna tell people about this and nobody's gonna believe me, okay? Here, here's my concern. My concern is that people are gonna think that I'm nuts. Nobody's gonna believe me. God addresses this. He says, well, I'm gonna give you these signs to do. 
three things in particular, that when you do these, people will know that what you're saying is, is, is true. There is a force greater than anything in this world that's with you, me, that, that, that I'm with you. Moses seems satisfied by that. He says, okay, I'm gonna express one last concern. So two questions and then two concerns. Here's the concern. Um, I, I, I think you need someone, God, that can articulate all of this in a way that's compelling. And I, I'm slow of speech. Guy, this, this is not my forte. I, I'm not good at this. I think you need someone else. God responds again to this concern. Is it, it's kind of like what I said earlier about like, I'm with you. I mean, who, who gave you the ability to speak at all? Who, who put a tongue in your mouth? Moses, look, I'm gonna be with you. Now let's pause here. And it, it, the conversation takes a turn in just a second, but let, let's pause here. What, what do we learn about God in this? What, what do we learn about the nature? If you're here because you want to know more about this whole God thing, what do we learn about the nature of God here? Do you see how patient God is? Do you see how, how persistent and painstaking he is? I mean, he takes the two questions and the two concerns and he just answers them straight up. He doesn't seem concerned or threatened by the questions that Moses has. In fact, he, he continues to engage with him. We see that God is a God who is patient and God is a God who is willing to engage with people, not threatened by their questions or threatened by their concerns. And what do we see about Moses? Well, we see the same thing. That Moses is one who steps aside in order to engage with this mystery, not assuming that he knows everything about the way the world works, not assuming that he can know everything just through the, the, the things that he can observe, but that, that perhaps there's something more mysterious out there. He engages with this question, and then he begins to engage with God. He asks the questions. He expresses the concerns. And here's what we begin to see even in the first little bit about Moses, who again goes on to have many more conversations with God, that what marks Moses' relationship with God more than anything else, more than him being perfect, more than him always being faithful, more than him knowing everything, what marks Moses' relationship with God is that he engages with God. I told you this was gonna sound simple. It may sound too simple, but what it means to walk with God is not that we be perfect, but that we be engaged. That's what it means to be someone who walks with God. And now post Jesus, what it means to be someone who walks in the way of Jesus is it means that, yeah, we, we learn from his life. We learn from his teachings. It means that we seek to live in the way that Jesus lived. And what it means that we, like Jesus, we engage with God. We engage through prayer. We engage through scripture. We engage through conversations with other people. What it means to be a follower of God is not that we be perfect, but that we be engaged. Now, driving this home even further on the flip side is that right after this, Moses says a sixth thing. So far, he's asked questions and he's expressed concerns. The last thing that he says in this conversation is he says, I'm out. He says, please, God, send someone else. That's when God's temperament changes. It says that he becomes uh, angry. That doesn't mean that he's mad. It doesn't mean he's throwing a tantrum. It doesn't mean that his feelings are hurt by Moses. What it means is that he knows what is best and he now works to continue to make sure that his purposes are achieved, but he's gonna go a little bit of a different route. Instead of Moses going and flying solo in his leadership role, he's gonna tag team him with Aaron, which later on, as we'll see, has catastrophic consequences. God says, we'll deal with those later, but for right now, I'm gonna tag team you with your brother Aaron, and that seems to satisfy Moses. So Moses re-engages, and he goes back into Egypt. Read the rest of chapter four and get into chapter five, and you'll see what begins to happen. And what you're gonna see as we continue to go all throughout Exodus is that Moses makes mistakes. I mean, you get to the end of chapter five and Moses is like chastising God. He's, he's, he's upset with, with God. He's crying out to God saying, what is your deal, man? But he doesn't run away, he doesn't flee. He stays engaged. When I did my internship at the Children's Hospital several years ago, the best bit of advice that I had to offer to parents who were really struggling with kids that were very, very sick is stay engaged. So many of them would be apologetic saying, like, I just, like, I, I cried out to God last night just like in, in anger. Or I, like, I, I just, I, I just, 
I'm having a really hard time trusting right now and all these things. And I would have to say, don't, don't pretend like those things aren't there. Maybe the only honest prayer that you can pray is one out of frustration or one out of anger. What God wants is God wants us to be honest. What God wants is God wants us to be engaged. What it means to be a follower of God is not to be perfect. It means to be engaged. Now, typically at this point in the sermon, this is where I would give you some practical examples, try to make this really uh, clear what it looks like for us today, 21st century Americans, and, and all, all of those things. But I can't do that better than what I'm about to show you. Stay engaged in this video, and then after the video, I'm gonna wrap it up for just a moment. But stay engaged with this video because this story is the story of someone who got engaged with God and it made a difference. Check out this story. I always felt like there was something about me that didn't fit my version of what I thought the perfect Christian was supposed to be. So I'm Tori Watkins, and I'm a relatively new member of HPUMC. My husband and I moved to Dallas a couple of months before the pandemic started. And we knew when we moved to Dallas that we wanted to find a church home. A couple of months later, we were watching and Matt started talking about the Genesis study. And he mentioned how there's various phases of people in the church. There's people that are just now at that stage where they're becoming followers of Jesus and are really deciding to make that chance, make that leap. And then there are people where I felt I was, where I'd bought into that. I was a follower of Jesus. I felt like I had found a church home, but I needed to take that next step. And it, it really touched my heart and drew me to decide to do the Genesis study. I had felt like I'd found a church home, but I hadn't developed those personal connections and relationships with people at the church yet. And so I saw the small group as an opportunity to do that. One of my small group leaders reached out to me and we went to coffee and we've developed a friendship, you know, outside of that small group. And having someone at the church and being able to establish that connection has made me feel so much more at home at the church. I think for a really long time for me, I grew up and had one idea of church and one idea of religion and one idea of God, I always felt like there was something about me that didn't fit my version of what I thought the perfect Christian was supposed to be. And by reading Genesis and reading the stories of imperfect people that God chose to do extraordinary things and lead a nation, showed me that it's not perfection, that's the expectation, it's trying and failing and trying again. And to see the story of all of the characters in Genesis, you don't find a perfect person. Um, and to see that God works through imperfect people radically changed the way that I see myself as a person of faith. My mom and I have a profound relationship and I love her so much. But growing up, she and I had a complicated relationship when it came to our faith because we always saw the things that we seemingly disagreed on whether, rather than the things that we did agree on or saw common ground for. On a whim, I picked up an extra Genesis book for my mom and she and I read it all together. Every Friday, we would have a phone conversation and we would talk about the scandalous things or the crazy stories that we read that week or the things that we didn't remember reading years ago and couldn't, couldn't believe that we had passed over. And through that, she and I not only discovered that we have a lot of similarities and there are actually parts of God and religion in our faith that we agree on and we found common ground in. But it also gave us a chance to have conversations on a level that we never had before. And it transformed our relationship. So if you're already bought in, get someone else in your life to do it with you. Before I started reading Genesis, I was not a daily Bible reader. I went to church and I would do devotionals and 
spend some time the first 15 minutes of my day, but I never sat down and actually read chapters of the Bible on a daily basis. And starting my day with that, followed by Matt's video on Instagram, changed my day. It changed the perception that I had of my day and how I went into work in the mornings. I had such a great experience with Genesis that when it came to an end, I was really sad. and. As you know, Exodus is chapter two of Genesis, and I'm so excited to start reading Exodus in the coming weeks with the church. You never know what, where this journey could lead you. I'm grateful to Tori for sharing her story. That story is on social media, and I hope that you'll share that story with other people also. And friends, I want to streak here, okay? I, God has done something with these last two sermons, and I'm hoping that this streak goes to three. Because what I'm hoping is that today, after talking about engaging with God, I am hoping that we will see more people engage with God through Exodus than we could have ever imagined. I hope that that'll be you. I hope that you'll invite other people to be a part of that also. We're only a week into this. You can catch up pretty quickly, two chapters a day this week, and you're caught up. God can do something by engaging in this way. And I hope that you'll engage with your questions. If you have questions or concerns about this whole God, this God thing, reach out to us at the church and we will connect you with a pastor to help walk through these things. Reach out to a friend that, that seems to, to know God, to know about God. Reach out to that friend, engage in this way. But I've got to say this too. I'm really hopeful that this streak will end at three because next week we're talking about the plagues, okay? And if this streak extends to four, we might all be in trouble. Next week, we're gonna talk about the plagues. As Pharaoh and God go toe to toe, as God through Moses begins to crack this jar open. And as we see how God through Moses begins to free his people, my hope is that you will see how God through other people in your life through the story of Exodus, through prayer, that you will begin to see how God is cracking open the jar of the things that are holding you down also. Friends, we didn't get to the Powerball and we didn't get to the Falcons winning the Super Bowl, but I hope that in some way that this message of what God is doing and how we can engage with him has been helpful to you and has been inspiring to you. If you got nothing else, get this. Walking with God is not about being perfect. It's just about being engaged. God, thanks for this time. I pray that your spirit will continue to guide us, continue to lead us, continue to help us to be men and women and teenagers and kids who are engaged with you. And Lord, I just know that you will use that to do big things in our life, to continue to grow us into who we are meant to be and to lead us towards what we are meant to do. We pray these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, friends. To come out of sadness. To come out of sadness From wherever you've been To come brokenhearted Let rescue begin and come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrows that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrows that heaven can feel. So lay down your burdens and lay down your
rested indoors. Earth has no sorrows that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens and lay down your shame. And all who are broken, lift up your sorrows that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrows that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, and all who are broken, lift up your We're so glad that you joined us in worship this morning. If this content moved you in any way, we hope that you'll share it with friends or family because church isn't just about absorbing information from a screen. It's actually about growing in community. So share with those you love, talk, question, wrestle, and dig deep. As always, you can partner with us financially by giving at hpmc.org slash give. So much of the work we've been able to continue through this pandemic has been because of your partnership and generosity. And now will you receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and may he give you peace. Amen. <laughs>